Hello again, everyone. Welcome to this late February episode of Cotton Grower Magazine's Cotton Companion Podcast. And if it's late February, that means the National Cotton Council's wrapped up its annual meeting. Uh, the Mid-South Farm and Gin Show is ready to kick off. And cotton producers in and around South Texas are, uh, are either getting ready to go or already going. I'm Jim Stedman, editor of Cotton Grower. And joining me today, as usual, is my good friend and associate, Beck Barnes. Beck, there's nothing like busy season, or at least the anticipation of it, to get the blood pumping and the adrenaline flowing in this business. Yeah, yeah, gosh, I'm just sitting here. <laughs> I heard you say that about the South Texas guys getting ready to plant, and I like <laughs> let out a, a, a subconscious exhale. I said, what? <laughs> um, yeah, because I guess it is. Yeah, it's going to be that season. I mean, it's been uh, 60 here for the past couple of days in, in Memphis. I mean, that's unseasonable, but it also is the first kind of hint of springtime. And uh, I know a lot of our guys around here and elsewhere are yeah, starting to feel that itch, that plant yeah. planting itch, um, you know, uh, bags of seed being bought if they're not already bought. And uh, yeah, it's going to be go time. But first things first, I know, Jim, what we got in front of us this week is the Mid-South Gin Show, and I'm excited about that. That'll be downtown at the newly redesigned Renaissance Center, where they will have, what, 18,000, 20,000 people through the door uh, over the, the course of the weekend. Days. Yep. Yeah, so uh, we're excited about that. Uh, it's always fun for me to see friends from around the, from the Boot Hill down to, you know, Louisiana Delta uh, buddies will be there, and we have, I know, Jim, you are well aware, we're going to have some Looking at our RSVP list, some Alabama and royalty uh, coming in to uh, to our Achievement Award luncheon, which we will be hosting at the Gin Show. Who all do we have? I think uh, our buddy Nick McMicken's going to be there, and I think I saw maybe Mike Tate. And Mike Tate's going to be there. Hollis Isbell. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's uh, you know, and and the en entire Isbell clan, it looks like, which is great because yeah, you know, you know they're all they're all great growers and, and great producers and. And, and obviously they're there to, uh, you know, to see the show, but more importantly, to come in and, and, uh, and pay tribute to Jimmy Sanford, our Cotton Achievement Award winner, uh, who we will be presenting the, officially presenting the award to uh, at this luncheon. Yeah, yeah, always nice to be able to hand him that award and, and shake his actual real mm -hmm. life hand uh, in front of his peers. You know, we, I say that with a, a hint. <laughs> I don't know, sarcasm or frustration, but I, I can remember not too long ago, 2020, uh, Daylon Hancock, God bless him out there on the high piece. And, you know, we were supposed to schedule to give him word in April of 2020. And then life happened, uh, yep. as everybody will remember. And it took us a long time to be able to do that. So, yeah, we don't take it for granted. We're happy to have uh, Jimmy with us this week here in Memphis. Definitely, definitely. Well, and I think the other thing we, we, we can definitely say, if South Texas is rolling, by the time the gin show ends on Saturday evening, that really is kind of the the official beginning of the Mid-South planting season. Not necessarily cotton at this point, but uh, certainly corn is uh, is going to be top of mind and uh, folks will be ready to hit the fields. Uh, yeah. it, you know, meeting season is over as of this uh, as of this weekend. Yeah, you're right. That corn window will be opening soon enough. Yep, definitely. Well, speaking of corn, and we're not going to talk about corn anymore, uh, we do have some interesting items to discuss today, most of them coming out of the National Cotton Council annual meeting that was held in Dallas February 10th through the 12th. This is, of course, the business meeting for the council where delegates from each cotton producing state gather to determine the focus and the priorities for the organization for the coming year, elect new officers for the council and its affiliated organizations, and also to get a first look at the results of the council's planting intention survey for 2023. Now, just obviously to set the stage, Cotton Gore published its projected acreage survey for the year on January 2nd. When we round up the number, our acreage uh, result came to 11.6 million acres of cotton in the U.S. this year. And of course, the more I talked with folks at the Beltwide Conference and, and even a little bit at, this, at the NCC annual meeting, I was pretty much resolved that we had set the ceiling for acreage prognostication for 2023. And some of the experts hinted that we, yeah, maybe you know, we were just likely a little bit too high. So then Jody Campiche, the uh, VC Vice President for Economics and Policy Analysis, 
uh, came up to the annual meeting session, unveiled the results of the council's much more scientific survey, and they projected 11.4 million acres. I can, I can honestly say, as I have told economists, friends, and other folks, we operate sort of on a blind squirrel theory, and the blind squirrel came through again. Yeah, hold on, Jim. Give me a second. Burr, 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 burr. <laughs> That's me tooting our horn, tooting our own horn, uh, as we are uh, apt to do. Yeah, I'm not going to spike the football until the USDA no, uh, no final comes out. Of course, I mean, um, who knows what could happen between now and uh, when that planting window is truly full throttle here, probably by end of April, early May, uh, across much of the mid south, hopefully. Uh, in yeah. the southeast, but yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to say this without sign, sounding uh, overly self confident. But I mean, I told you, we told, I said it two weeks ago, you know, on this podcast. I mean, it always we put our number out, and then people kind of, you know, uh, say, "Oh, I think you think too high. I think you're too low." And then every yeah. year we wound up, we wind up, you know, almost on top of the number. So. Uh, maybe we're doing something right. I don't well, know. I, I know I got I got I was contacted by uh, by someone at, at Louis Dreyfus who's worked with Joe Nicosia and is helping Joe put his presentation for the Gin Show together. And um, they said, I mean, they always reference our our study in Joe's presentation. And you know, I said the one thing about it is we're not afraid to stick our necks out on this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, so far, I mean that. Or go ahead. I don't mean. To and, and I said, and, and so far it hasn't been fatal. Yeah. Uh, to us at all yeah i mean it's um we are not data scientists and we are not uh soothsayers but yeah it tells you a little bit a little bit that uh allenberg folks really pay attention to our number i've had yep. uh, cargill people reaching out to me the past couple of weeks wanting to know about our number and that's pretty our annual occurrence so you know and then that'll tell you something i mean those guys who are really really are paid to pay attention to it and who are data scientists yes uh, they want to know about what we're seeing so you know again i i said i wasn't going to spike the football but it feels like i'm kind of halfway spiking it so i'll just be quiet here but uh yeah i'm proud <laughs> good i'll just say nice work jim good yeah stuff. it's not not bad for two country boys with sec college degrees so yeah, uh, yeah. On it. But anyway, let's let's swing back to the NCC uh, survey and look at some of the regional numbers that they they said. Overall, this 11.4 million number represents a 17 percent decrease from 2022. Uh, of that total, 11.2 million are upland acres. The balance is going obviously to the extra long staple Pima production. Over in the southeast, they're they're showing a nine and a half percent decline in cotton acreage, down to 2.4 million acres. And that's primarily due to an increase in corn, soybeans, wheat, and peanuts. Not a big surprise. In the Mid-South, growers intend to plant 1.7 million acres. That's down 16.2% from last year. Again, probably due to an increase in corn, soybeans, wheat, and other crops. Move over to the Southwest, growers there intend to plant 19.6% less cotton this year although Kansas growers are expected to plant 1.7% more. Uh, as, you, as you can expect, Texas acres are expected to decline the most, uh, and, the, and the NCC number was uh, showing a 21.2% decline in Texas. Uh, they've had some moisture, they've had some rain, they've had some snow, but they still don't have the deep, deep soil moisture at this point. So, you know, the jury's gonna be out for a while on, on Texas. Over in the West, Upland cotton acreage is supposed to uh, is expected to decline 33.7 percent, which would be the lowest level on record for Cal Arizona and California, primarily due to drought conditions and water availability issues. But then the ELS acres, the Pima acres, are expected to increase by 0.5 percent in uh, 2023, up to 184,000 acres spread across Arizona, California, New Mexico in Texas. And Beck, as you mentioned, uh, the next reality checks on intended acreage. Uh, first one comes here in just a few days from Joe Nicosia's annual Cotton Outlook presentation here at the uh, Mid-South Farm and Gin Show. And again, the USDA planting intentions report at the end of March. That's, that's sort of the big bullseye target at that point. Yeah. Um, 
you know, as <laughs> the producers of Cotton Grower Magazine, you know, we wish there'd be 16 million acres coast to coast. Uh, so, you know, we don't love seeing a, a decrease in acreage, uh, you know, just to be transparent, but uh, you certainly understand, right, Jim? I mean, you know, last year, last year was so zany. I mean, there's never been a year like it where prices were just up there north of a dollar. And uh, you look at that and you go, oh man, that's got, that has to encourage so many uh, acres. And then I guess it, in a way it did, but you know, that's only half the story with inputs being so high and some inputs being so scarce. And it's just kind of been a zany uh, year or two. And mm -hmm. so we understand that that number coming down just a bit. Uh, we know that competitive crops prices are doing pretty good too. So um, yeah, you know, 11 and a half million acres uh, thereabouts uh, from California to the Carolinas. Probably about right uh, is how I feel about it. Um, love to see more, but yeah, I suspect that's about right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll see what USDA says. They always, always seems to be the definitive, he says with air quotes, yeah. number, <laughs> number yeah. that everybody, everybody finally looks at. Right. Well, and also just a uh, couple of quick things from annual meeting. Uh, are some new folks in newly elected positions for the coming year. Gene Seeley, who's a Jenner from Pima, Arizona, is a new president of the National Cotton Jenners Association. Steve Dyer, who's a merchant from Cordova, Tennessee, has served as Cotton Council International President for the year. Nathan Reed, who's a cotton producer over in Mariana, Arkansas, was re-elected chairman of American Cotton Producers for 2023. And Sean Holliday, cotton producer from La Mesa, Texas, is a 2023 chairman of the National Cotton Council. And we're going to have a little bit more about Sean here in, in just a minute. This meeting is also awards time for several of these affiliated organizations. Curtis Stewart, who is a longtime Jenner and industry leader from Spade, Texas, received the 2022 Horace Hayden National Cotton Jenner of the Year Award. Dr. Greg Holt, is a research leader at USDA South Plains Ginning Lab out in Lubbock, received the uh, National Cotton Jenners Association Charles C. Owen Distinguished Service Award. Dr. Andy Jordan, who a number of us know very, very well from his time with the National Cotton Council and all the, the affiliated work that he has done in the industry, received the uh, 2022 Harry S. Baker Distinguished Service Award from the National Cotton Council. And the late Kenneth Hood, uh, producer, Jenner, and industry leader from Gunnison, Mississippi, was honored as the recipient of the Oscar Johnston Lifetime Achievement Award. So congratulations to all. There are many, many more uh, who moved into leadership roles with the council for 2023, uh, more than we have time to talk about, on, certainly on the podcast. Uh, you can find the information on all of these new leaders online at cottongrower.com. And finally, just a quick reminder that March 31st is the deadline for U.S. cotton producers to enroll in the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol and complete their data entry for the 2022 crop year. That can be done online at trustuscotton.org, or additional lists can be provided by Tillman White, who is Trust Protocol Program Operations Manager, via email at twhite at cotton.org. Now, I mentioned Sean Holliday just, uh, just a few moments ago. Sean is the recently elected 2023 chairman of the National Cotton Council. He has extensive experience in industry leadership with the council with a special emphasis on farm policy. Uh, and in a farm bill year that we're looking at this right now, that experience is gonna be very, very beneficial to the cotton industry indeed. So I had an opportunity to visit with Sean during the annual meeting to get his thoughts on the challenges ahead for the year. And here's what he had to say. We're coming to you from the National Cotton Council annual meeting in Dallas. And I'm joined by the newly elected NCC chairman for 2023, that's Sean Holliday. He's a cotton grower from La Mesa, Texas. Sean, congratulations and welcome to the Cotton Companion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jim. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, let's start with a little background because uh, not everybody's going to not everybody's going to know you. Not everybody's going to be familiar with with your background. Tell me about your farming operation. How long have you been farming? Uh, how'd you get started? 
Well, I grew up farming. I was a, I was driving a tractor when I was 11 years old, so uh, it's kind of in my blood. Uh, me and my wife and daughter operate H2H Farms, which is in mainly southeastern Dawson County, in the uh, in part of Martin County, uh, about 50 miles south of Lubbock. And we uh, farm primarily cotton. Every once in a while, we'll we'll grow a few peanuts, but we're mainly cotton farmers. And uh, that's uh, basically all I've done all my life is farm cotton. Okay. Well, since we're here at the council meeting, I think it's nobody gets involved in the National Cotton Council by accident. Mm -hmm. uh, when and how did you first get started with the organization? Oh my gosh. 27 years ago, probably, uh, somewhere around there, I was at a Bowieville meeting in La Mesa, Texas, and Kent Nix, who was chairman of the Cotton Board at one time, uh, was a friend of the family, and I had made the mistake of making a comment on the <laughs> Bowieville program. That's the and, way it always starts, isn't it? Yes, and uh, he turned around and, and looked at me, and, and he said, we need to get you involved, and uh, and he set about doing that, and before long, uh, I was in La Mesa Cotton Growers, and uh, it didn't take me long, and he had put me on the executive committee at Plains Cotton Growers, and that's how it all started, and I've been part of Cotton Council ever since. Uh, mm -hmm. Did a lot of uh, farm policy work, started out working with Brazilians in the Brazil case, and, uh, and uh, through all of that uh, trying times, and... Uh, <laughs> Ended up with on the Farm Policy Task Force as chair on that for the national for the American cotton producers for seven years, and uh, been working in various committees and doing different jobs within the Cotton Council ever since. Okay, well, obviously here at the annual meeting, you know, delegates are, are getting together. They're determining priorities and goals for the organization uh, for the coming year, and that's everything. I think covering everything from bail packaging to research and education and health and safety and international trade and and so on. Uh, but it is a farm bill year, and with your background in the farm policy committee, uh, I'm sure that uh, it's going to take a little bit of time for you this year. Yeah, I expect to be doing a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of traveling to uh, D.C. And, uh, and then I'll do a lot of uh, regional meetings and stuff with the growers and, and, and at their meetings. But I, I expect to be called on to do a lot of work going and uh, stating our case and working on the farm bill process and working with different Congress people. I, uh, it's not something that I haven't done in the past. You mm -hmm. know, we we worked very, uh, very well with uh, we uh, I was in, involved in getting the seed cotton program started sure and uh, so we've been uh, we've been uh, busy it seems like it's been an ongoing process ever since the Brazil case you right. know of, of, of either trying to get some sort level of support or get back in the farm program or get the farm program that we we have a, a change to something that works for us so it's a uh, it it it, uh, it doesn't seem like it. It's actually fact that we we've been in some sort of negotiation for the past ten years. Mm -hmm. Well, what's uh, knowing we're going into deliberations on the farm on the farm bill? What's the industry up against going into uh, as as we start this process right well, now? Well, I think the the biggest problem we've got, uh, you know, we've we've the ad hoc uh, money that's been spent over the past few years, whether it be trade. Uh, China trade payments or uh, or the disaster payments due to uh, environmental difficulties the that's all emergency spending so it's not in baseline it's not something we can capture and, and look at like farm bill money and and uh, so that that does not uh, go in the equation and that's really what's worked for the producer uh, in these trying times the level of support underneath it hadn't worked and Getting some of those monies uh, adjusted or, or budgeted to increase our baseline is is uh, project number one, mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll be able to accomplish that. Uh, other than that, it's the uh, uh, it's basically the uh, you know it's uh, it's the it's the most it's it's the common things that we always face. You know, we don't want to have any harmful amendments on uh, crop insurance or any of our mm -hmm. risk management tools that we have now. Right. Uh, but it's uh, don't do no harm. But uh, we need we need a better deal, if we can possibly achieve it. Sure. 
Any other priorities that uh, that you think are going to need some extra attention this year? Well, I, I think uh, when you look at the, uh, the 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 amount of money we're having to spend growing these crops in the the uh, the in all commodities, uh, the level of support that they have underneath them, there's such a huge gap. You have to be in such a negative cash flow base basis to uh, ever impact that that safety mm -hmm. net. That uh, you know, I think that's 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 a huge problem, and uh, and I, I don't know if the political will is there to address that or not. But we're going to certainly be working on it. Okay. Now I know you farm in an area that. Uh, that really suffered last year due to uh, to drought. How has that impacted your plans going into this season? You know, we, we farm in a very volatile area, so we're used we're used to having that situation. The problem is, is the input costs are so incredibly high that its its impact is just more than normal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really where it's business as usual, except for. Uh, you know, we're we're having to really, really fine tune what we're looking at as far as inputs, and you know, we're still pretty dry, so uh, we're hoping for a change in the weather. But you know, it's just making sure that we 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 take all of the uh, uh, hard look at our insurance products and make sure we take uh, uh, take uh, the covers that we need, and and we'll be we'll be taking. Uh, you know, area-wide coverage as well at this point because of the the weather being like it is. Mm -hmm. And but it's a uh, it's just a you know it's an all-encompassing managing a management decision at this point for everybody, not just us. It's just mm -hmm. there's not one thing that you can't not you cannot do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So where are you going to find time to do all, make sure all these decisions are made? And, uh, <laughs> well, I've got uh, <laughs> the, the, the beauty part of this is, is when I'm running around trying to accomplish some of these things, my wife and daughter are partners in my operation and they're going to be taking care of that. So uh, uh, they're going to be uh, uh, taking care of it at home. And, and uh, I'm used to doing this stuff. You know, I've been doing it a long time. I know the value of it. You know, I think one of the most important things we can do as leaders is develop new leadership. Right. And the uh, uh, the younger ones coming up, you know, when you get them involved and see, this stuff doesn't materialize uh, by accident. And it, and if we if we're not working for it, it you know, it's you, you know, I had a guy tell me when I first came in years ago that uh, you know you're either going to be have a seat at the table or you're going to be served. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be watched for dinner. Yeah. And, and uh, we always need to be at the table. We may not be getting exactly what we want, but we want to be at the table every time, uh, every time. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to support, we, you know, it's imperative that we support our local, regional, and, and national organizations because uh, that's the only defense we have against some of this stuff. Definitely. Now, you mentioned your family, because mm -hmm. like so many of us in the cotton industry, you have a true cotton household. Everybody's everybody's in it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's involved. Uh, and you said while you're out farming and handling business, uh, your wife and your daughter are kind of keeping things going. Tell me a little bit about some of the stuff that they're involved with. Well, Katie is right now just started the policy education uh, uh, group here in the National Cotton Council so she's she's doing that she's she handles a lot of the insurance uh, uh, she, she's learned the loan documentation and she's uh, graduated Texas Tech with a Bachelor of Science in math and uh, so she's helps helps her dad technologically <laughs> and mathematically and uh, Julie's uh, was appointed to the cotton board uh, several years ago and, and she's a, uh, very involved in the cotton board, so uh, we we take our leadership very seriously. And uh, and uh, you know, uh, farming's our life, and uh, and you know, and we know through experience, seeing some of this stuff evolve through my participation early on, that that it's it's one of the most important things we do as American farmers is is support our industry. Mm -hmm. And if you're not supporting your industry, it's a uh, we're all going to be uh, we're all going to be in trouble, and, and uh, I've met a lot of guys in this in this organization and the other organizations that uh, that have taken their time to uh, blaze a, a trail in front of us and done a lot of good. And uh, you know, it, it it you can't advance your cause if you're not involved in doing doing what you need to be doing. Mm -hmm.
Definitely. Well, I know it's going to be a busy year for you. It, uh, it already is, in fact. Uh, I want to thank you for your time and your friendship uh, and your service to the industry. And I look forward to, uh, to what the council is going to be able to achieve in the coming year. And uh, I'll be sure to check in with you from time right. to time. Well, I appreciate it, Jim, as always. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. All right. Great. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. So, all right. Well, that's going to be it for this episode of the Cotton Companion podcast. Uh, we want to thank, again, uh, Sean Holliday for taking time uh, from his hectic annual meeting schedule to visit with Jim. And as always, we want to say thank you to our dear listeners for joining us. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this episode. And if you did, if you liked what you heard, please be sure to spread the word and tell your buddies about the Cotton Companion. Here's where and how they can find us. You can find the Cotton Companion in three easy ways. First, go to cottongrower.com forward slash companion, or simply click the podcast tab at the top of the homepage. Second, subscribe to our channel on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts these days. And three, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, the Cotton Grower e-news, that's delivered to your email inbox every Tuesday morning. You can do that by going to cottongrower.com forward slash subscribe. Also, be sure to follow Cotton Grower on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter. And on Facebook, you'll find us by searching for Cotton Grower Magazine. The Cotton Companion podcast is produced twice monthly by Tyler Hatch and Kim Henderson, our talented colleagues at the world headquarters for Meister Media Worldwide in lovely Willoughby, Ohio. I'm Beck Barnes. He's Jim Stebman. And we'll be back with you in two weeks with the next episode of The Cotton Companion. Yeah, he works and he works and he works and he works all day. God made a farmer.